I'm coming for you, Static, because I've got the power. Feeling now, they say I changed for the worst. Bad guys still alive, it won't change for the hearse. I run the streets. Let the bass kick. This is your boy Mike Fallon with another episode of Sister Cinema with the one and only Gary Sturgis. How you doing today, sir? I'm good. I cannot complain. It's a beautiful day out here at uh, We Can Be Heroes. Yes. yes. So let's just start off with how does it feel to know after all these decades you're still one of the most beloved DC villains of all time in anime history? It's actually mind-blowing i i had no clue i've been spending the last 20 years of my life working on my film career so i had no idea that so many great things was happening in animation and that people were so enthralled with the uh characters that i played especially like uh, ebon on static shock i had no clue that people were still you know loving it the way they are but i've had great fan support and a lot of people have uh told me that i was a part of their childhood and that means a lot to me well basically i mean we're talking about this before we started recording is that uh your character, if we had to do a comparison to like Marvel or someone else, with your character's motivations, I would really say, and some of the fan base who know how the show goes, he was like Static Shock's Magneto in the sense of what his uh, objectives are. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, first of all, that's, a, that's an interesting, you know, comparison. That's huge. Um, it, playing a villain uh, like, like, uh, like Ebon against Static Shock, you know, if you, for those who watch the cartoon, you know, one of the things about my character that was interesting outside of his intelligence is that he had a way of rounding uh, rounding out a team. He was always looking for other meta breed kids that were sort of astray that he could bring into a fold and create a family. So uh, of all the villains that were a part of the Static Shock uh, universe, he was the one that was about uni uniting more than one person. A lot of these guys were just solo villains, you know what I'm saying? But he had, his, he had a whole meta breed. So, you know, he's the original OG of putting together a gang. <laughs> or so one would say a new organized culture. A new organized culture, yes. The, the, the new organized culture of, of, of crime. <laughs> basically, basically crime was the aspect of it, but man. And so what are your thoughts now to know that, that Static Shock is so beloved that now there's going to be an HBO Max film of it coming out? That's huge. Uh, I'm hoping that you guys remember to call me. I'm still here and available to play Ebon. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm happy to see that uh, people saw what we saw 20 years ago when we put this thing together. Uh, we saw a cartoon that was not just entertaining, but also uh, edutainment. You know what I'm saying? We were able to educate people by using... Uh, modern things that were happening in society to kids every day at the time and we took those things and made those things out of storylines which which made a, a universal story that people could relate to yeah i think the one thing that separated your series from the other animated series is that you tackled real life issues head on like whether it be about the bullying and gun violence or with gears dad being a racist like what are your thoughts about those themes and how it's been 20 years so well, I think at the time, those themes were very, very important. We, we're in a different time now where stuff like that would probably be considered normal. But at the time, 20 years ago, to see stuff like that was phenomenal. And a lot of young people, what I loved about it was it was multicultural. You had a, a, a character that represented pretty much every race, every sexuality, every creed. So it was an all-inclusive um, cartoon. But bigger than that is the lessons that were taught episode by episode because it always was a cartoon with a, with a, with a moral. It always had a story that had a moral value to it because we wanted kids to see that we can write things that are relevant to what's going on in your life today, not just animation that lasts you know, for 20, 30 years to come, but something that's actually relevant to the times today. So I love that they dealt with real life issues. Exactly, because I think that's what, because not only being a DC property, but you guys were the first ever animated property that was spawned from the Milestone universe. Right. Exactly, right. right? So what are your thoughts now that they've been rebooting Milestone in the comics? Well, I haven't seen the new rebooted stuff, but I'm glad that they're, they're rebooting Milestone because without Milestone, we wouldn't have shows like Static Shock. Yeah. These guys were putting out really good stuff. Now, I heard now... I. I'm not spaying for his hand, but I did have a couple of fans that came up to uh, to my table today, and they were speaking about the new milestone because I haven't, you know, been versed with it. And they were saying that it wasn't as 
solid as it was the first time around, but these are hardcore fans that were really, really big milestone fans. I would have to, you know, read it myself to see see the difference of where we are where we are in time now. But milestone is definitely the 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 the, the bar. I mean. It, you created a, a series that is timeless at this point, and it was fused into a bigger universe. So you, you, what, what more could you ask for? Well, I mean, I would just say overall, it's what we would call Black Excellence Personified. Yes, and I was a part of that Black Excellence Personified, and I'm honored. Yeah. So I have a question. Over, as Objectively, let's just, let's just be real. Everything you are a part of or touch, it becomes like a hit franchise or like you add to it. I mean, Milestone DC, that's one thing. But I don't think you get enough recognition for being in all the Spider-Man video games as different characters like Luke Cage, Batman Beyond. So, I mean, what's your thoughts on the video, um, voicing the Marvel characters in the video games and then voicing people in Batman Beyond? Well, video games are just the next level of, uh, of animation. It's, it's playable animation, you know. Um, I, I'm actually up for I'm, I'm doing one now called Dragon Paw. So I'm about, about to do another animated game. Uh, it's, it's, to me, it's the same thing. It's like doing a cartoon except you get to interact with it. So the video games are a nice crossover. And most of the cartoons that I do end up being video games games as well like Batman Arkham Legends became a game uh, Scooby doing a cyber chase became a game so it, it opens up more avenues for us as talent and a different audience for us to display our talents too yeah but it's just to, to the point where it's like you were in the Spider-Man games that like emulate like, like the Sam Raimi movies and now Sam Raimi's back in the MCU doing Doctor Strange 2 right. and there was talks this week publicly about Sam Raimi maybe talking tomorrow about doing Spider-Man part four you know what I'm saying but it's, but it's like part of that that helped propel it to now 20 years later that just like stats mind-blowing to me just to, to he, even hear you say that that is mind-blowing because we, when we go out and do these things we never think of of the impact that they're going to have later on we just sort of do the job at the moment never thinking in the future people are going to be talking about this and it's going to impact people in ways that we couldn't have possibly imagine when we sat in the booth and did it speaking of impacts now i'm not confirming nothing here guys it's just a maybe let's talk about this so michael keaton has come back in the Flash and the Batgirl movie, okay. and everybody has not stopped talking the last three years about a Batman Beyond live action. And if that was to go down, saying, not confirming nothing here, guys, it's speculation, what would you want to be able to do if you can be a part of the Batman Beyond film if they were to hit you up? Anything. I mean, I mean, first of all, those who don't know my frat name, I'm Omega Sci Fi. I pledged uh, back in fall of 85. Batman is my frat name. You know what I'm saying? It's like, who knows me uh, in New Orleans from my fraternity days, that's actually what they called me. So I've always been sort of intrinsically connected to Batman some way, form or another. I've been on pretty much every other Batman cartoon out there, whether it was a small part or a large part. So if they were doing anything with Batman, I would hope that before my career ends, they call me to play something. I mean, I'd be happy to do two lines in the Batman project. You know what I'm saying? It's like just it's Batman. You know what I'm saying? Who, want, who doesn't want to be a part of that legacy? Okay, let, let, since you brought it up, let's just, let's just put it on the table. You talk about legacies. Outside of DC and Marvel, and you contributed to Scooby-Doo, what does it feel like to know you contributed to the Tyler Perry legacy and kingdom? Well, you know, I was there for the first film and the third film, and uh, for those who don't know, I wrote, uh, I was actually a star Tyler Perry for a while. I wrote uh, the first, I wrote on the first 10 episodes of Meet the Browns and uh, 25 episodes of House of Pain. So yeah, I'm, I'm one of the credited writers. There was seven of us in the room. Steve Coulter was the head writer. And uh, yeah, I got to work in the writer's room for six months over there. So I was not only a part of bringing the film culture uh, to the forefront, but I was also a part of some of the writing that went down there as well. I mean, look, look what you contributed to. Now he has the studio in Atlanta. And it's like, it's off the backs of like his, his efforts in your guys' efforts. And look what happened because of efforts, the studio was open and one of the first films was Panther. Isn't that amazing? It comes full circle. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of Tyler and the work that he's done. For those who don't know, uh, I've been on Tyler since he was 17. I was 20 when I met him. We were both two poor dudes with our shoes leaning to the side with dreams and hopes of being big in the entertainment business. And, you know, history has written itself. We, we see what how, the greatness that he's reached. And I'm happy to have been a part of some of the things that he's done and even the things that I've done with my career since, you know, with and without him. So, but, but, you know, it's great to see somebody that you knew uh, when you know what I'm saying people don't know that a lot of people don't know this but I wasn't even Christian until I met Tyler Tyler was a guy that got me to go to church and got me saved so if there's anything I thank him for more than the jobs and more than the opportunities I thank him for the opportunity of introducing me to Christ because I wouldn't have been I wasn't a church kid you know what I'm saying that's something he was a hundred percent of and he got me to go to church and I've been saved ever since so I thank him for that more than I thank him for the movie roles 
That's beautiful. So I want to close it off with this. Back to Static Shock. Cause I'm coming to circle because all you do is full circle. What are your thoughts? And I have to put it out there on if they were to do the live, since they're doing do live action, how would you feel about Cleo Thomas playing Ebon in the live action? Okay, I have no problem with Cleo Thomas playing Ebon. But, you know, at some point, the, the person becomes a bang baby and has to turn into a shadow, which means they're probably going to have to do some serious CGI. And at that point, I think y'all need to call Gary Sturgis to get this voice because, you know, you could have him. At the end of the day, the character is a teen. He's a young cat. You know, they're, they're, young, they're young people. But when it comes down to that voice, there is nobody on earth that can do Ebon to the degree that I could do Ebon. Why? Because Ebon was created because they heard my voice in a lesser role and wrote the character for me based upon what they heard. So there's absolutely, positively, no one else that could voice that character. I mean, and since they're doing it live action, um, you know, uh, Mr. Michael B. Jordan, um, I'm campaigning out to you right now, sir. Uh, I would love to work on this project as the voice of Ebon. Put whatever actor in there you want, but you need this voice. You know what it is, Michael. <laughs> Come on. Come on, Mike. Come on. Come on, Come on through, Mike. I love to work with you guys on the project. I have a lot of insight of the project because I was a part of the original cast. And I think my character is probably the only character that you can use uh, still in a live action because he, he's a shadow. So it's really more of a voice. And that's what I bring to the table. Where can people find you on social media? And Okay. Um, uh, if you're on social media, uh, I'm on Facebook heavily and my, under my name, Gary Sturgis. That's G-A-R-Y-S-T-U-R-G-I-S. -R -R and that's my Facebook handle. Uh, on Twitter and Instagram, it's Movie Star G, at Movie Star G. And I blue check mark so you'll know it's me. So earlier, I know that when you're at the other tables, you had a message for Static Shock. You want to repeat that message while you're on camera now? Oh, I'm coming for you, Static, because I've got the power. <laughs> He's coming for you, Static. Y'all, this is Mike Fallon with Citizen Cinema. I'll catch you on the next episode. Peace, brother. Oh. Thank you. I'm shadow boxing. Every day, new schemes, new traps, blue jeans, boots strapped in the city, new jack. News flash, I'm in a new class now with new math. So let's move forward and get cut off. Don't move back.